So enjoy this conversation with Eric Lerner. It's not only an exposition of Eric Lerner's ideas about cosmology, but also a beautiful historic analysis of the struggle between plasma cosmologies and gravitational cosmologies. I think you guys are going to love it. So tell me what you think in the comments, and I'll see you next time. Your book has this incredible opening chapter where you lay out what I take to be a story of the way that metaphysics shift, where sometimes you have very... You have this, this, this culture that says, no, things are comprehensible, things can be mechanistic, things can be understood, and then it swings where you have a different culture which says, no, actually, it's very weird and mysterious and beyond comprehension, and the stories that we tell that are built on those assumptions are very different. And so maybe for people that haven't read the book, you could start with that idea of the, like, the pendulum swing from eternity to beginning and back and forth right that's gone through history so the idea of a cosmological pendulum or a scientific pendulum was an idea that uh, was introduced to me by uh, Hannes Alfane so Hannes Alfane I think is probably the leading physicist of the second half of the 20th century he's pretty much founding father of modern plasma physics, which is the physics we use to understand most of the universe and that we are using to develop fusion energy here on Earth. So Alfane's concept uh, that he had developed by thinking about this problem of the development of the Big Bang uh, mathematical theory was that over history, there have been huge swings between an essentially authority-based uh, idea of how we get knowledge. We get knowledge from the Bible, from you know uh, the priesthood, and the science-based approach where we get knowledge by observing the universe, by observing the world around us, making hypotheses and testing those hypotheses by things that happen in the future. So, in brief, science gives us a way of partially knowing the future. That's its usefulness to us, and that's why science has allowed humanity to grow from uh, a very small population to the billions of people we have on the planet today. Um, and what he was particularly pointing to is that the big swing that you learned about in your, you know, elementary history books, you know, the scientific revolution, the overthrow of uh, the Ptolemaic, uh, Earth-centered universe, the development of science, that that big swing in the 20th century had started to partially swing back to mythology, to a mathematical mythology, and that's what's indicated in the uh, Big Bang. And what I developed in my book, which again was not original, was based on the ideas of uh, the historian C. Gordon Child, was that these swings were not happening in a vacuum, but corresponded to the development or de-development collapse of society, that societies that were hierarchical, uh, in which there were uh, there was slow development or even de-development, a dark age. Those corresponded to the periods where knowledge was coming from authority and that the periods in which society was developing rapidly, was moving forward, those were the periods where you had the development of uh, the scientific method. 
So what is the scientific method? So we were just discussing the idea of epistemology. So epistemology, nice Greek term, means your theory of how knowledge is acquired. How do we determine what is true? What is true in the universe? What is true in society? The scientific method is a method that humans have been using a lot longer than there's been anybody called scientists. It's the method in which we make observations that give us ideas, hypotheses about what is true. And then we test those hypotheses by making predictions about the future and seeing whether those predictions are right. If those predictions are right, then we accept that our hypothesis is true. So, to give my favorite example, when our ancestors were hunter-gatherers and there was the medicine man, and the medicine man would be explaining to his successor or assistant, you see this mushroom, you see how it's curled here and here and here. If you gather a basket full of these mushrooms, you can make a delicious soup. It's very nutritious. See this mushroom with little red markings here? You eat even a whole mushroom. You'll go to meet our ancestors very quickly. And I know that because I took a really, really tiny piece, which is what I do. And when I ate it, I got really, really sick. I am. You know, almost die. So that individual was making a hypothesis, you know, based on observations. Was I okay after eating this mushroom or not okay? He made a hypothesis that it was this characteristic of the mushroom, you know, a wavy uh, rim or something that identified specific species that could predict whether you thrived or died by eating this particular mushroom. And obviously, you know, the tribes that had the medicine men who had this, you know, basic primitive notion of scientific method, they were the tribes that survived and thrived. And those are our ancestors. The ones that said, you know, the spirit has told me all red mushrooms are good. Those weren't our ancestors because they all died off. So, in a very real sense, our, I don't have the exact quote, but Marx more or less said the test of truth is human survival, is our own existence. If we do something, for long enough that doesn't correspond to truth, we cease to exist. Now, that may not be true in the short run, but in the long run, that's true. In the long run, the more humanity as a whole uses the scientific method, the more of us there are and the better our lives are. When, when we lose that, then things start to go wrong. Thank <laughs> you.